Magnesium is integral for 600 plus biochemical processes in the human body, and yet most people are deficient. Common signs of magnesium deficiency include fatigue, muscle weakness, stunted growth, poor immune function, poor concentration and memory, hormonal imbalances, bone and teeth problems. Most people think grabbing a bottle of whatever cheap stuff on the shelf or at the top of Amazon will solve this. The common misconception is that consuming more magnesium will automatically improve health and well-being. The truth is there are various forms of magnesium, each of which is essential for a variety of physiological processes. Most people are deficient in all forms of magnesium, while even those considered healthy typically only ingest one or two kinds. Consuming all seven of magnesium's primary forms is the key to accessing all of its health benefits. That's why we pack seven forms of 450 milligrams of elemental magnesium into each serving of Wild Mag Complex. One dose a day is all you need. Learn more and grab a bottle today at wildfoods.co. Use code GENIUS for 10% off your order. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Um, my guest today is uh, Justin Hayes. Uh, he's the architect of the house of you he's a leading expert on college career personal branding and life maximization uh, he's a professor of marketing uh, again an author a college career and life coach at the house of you but um, he's a professor that has uh, depression himself so i thought it'd be a very interesting interview uh, to speak to about the you know the highs and lows the good and the bad and the difficulty of um, being incredibly successful yet i would get struggling with uh, with depression so Welcome, Dustin. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, if you would, uh, just tell the listeners a bit about your background, and then we'll you know, we'll talk about what you're working on today. Sure. Yeah. My background pro professionally, educationally, I uh, had my uh, undergrad in marketing management from Youngstown State, uh, my MBA from Walsh University, uh, have close to 20 years of say, life experience uh, uh, along with uh, experience in the in the workforce in a variety of industries, uh, you know, including uh, you know the in industrial, steel, uh, pet, electric, to to name a few, uh, in roles both manager roles, uh, so guiding and, and mentoring and, and helping a team, uh, and individual contributor roles uh, as well. Uh, additionally, uh, I, I do teach uh, and. Teaching is kind of in my DNA. Uh, I teach at Walsh University, teach marketing courses, undergrad, graduate, online, uh, in person, you name it. Um, and then recently uh, also uh, founded a nonprofit called Voices for Voices, which is uh, circled uh, or centered around mental health, uh, disability, addiction, treatment, uh, getting people the help that they they need uh, while also being able to financially sponsor individuals uh, to help them along that journey uh, whether they have insurance uh, or or not so uh, 
you know, taking, taking that step back, uh, you know, between the professional experience, uh, the experience of being a human, which does include a, a five day inpatient stay, uh, at Akron general hospital, where I was diagnosed with major depression, generalized anxiety, uh, low spectrum autism. And that has been about six years since, uh, that, that happened November of 2017. Yeah. What happened, um, for during and after the diagnosis? How did it, how is it impacting all the other stuff that you're doing? Yeah, I greatly impacted uh, well, what I was doing uh, to a degree that I wasn't aware of at, at the time. Uh, so I guess the lowest point what led me to be admitted into to the hospital, um, I had lost probably about 35 pounds. Uh, I was down to eating carrots and hummus. My body was feeling like I was allergic to everything else that I was eating, which is crazy. Uh, I was pulling away from uh, work assignments. Uh, so I was declining teaching assignments, uh, mentor assignments, and I really was just not sure how I mean, say life, life was going to continue for me. Uh, I didn't have suicide plans, which sometimes, uh, you know, supposed experts will say, oh, well, somebody is only thinking about suicide if they have a plan or they have an idea. And for me, that that was far from the case. Uh, all my actions, besides that particular uh, action of planning, uh, I had exhibited of pulling away, uh, spending time alone, uh, just had a real, real all the time. So besides being down 30 to between 30 and 40 pounds at the, at the lowest, uh, pulling away from engagements and, and things that I, I loved to do on, uh, I stopped going to concerts, uh, the, uh, the lights and the the sounds was really starting to impact me, meaning that it would just it would sound and feel like nails on a chalkboard to somebody who hasn't experienced it. And so, bands and concerts that I would had gone to for years and years was bothering me. The the lights uh, at the concerts, as well as grocery stores, I would walk in to a grocery store and I immediately have to walk out because I was so overstimulated and felt like I was going to pass out. Uh, I had panic attacks while I was driving. I had to be picked up several occasions uh, by my now wife uh, at uh, just different points uh, along the way. We were going to have dinner the one night and I wasn't able to make it. I felt like I was blacking out. Uh, I had a, just a real high level panic attack. And uh, what some of that came to was the fact I wasn't eating. And so my body, when it was trying to process information, experiences, it just wasn't, wasn't able to, didn't have the fuel to, to do that. Uh, and well, looking back, what do you think started this? What was there a particular event or did it just creep on you slowly? It, yeah. So it slowly crept, uh, so much so that over, you know, 35 years, uh, I had written, I think it was about 135 different things I felt guilt or shame about, uh, different relationships, uh, you know, wanting to date multiple people, multiple girls, partying, uh, blowing off family engagements, uh, blowing off just anything that didn't have to deal with, um, at, at, during that time, uh, didn't have to deal with drinking alcohol and picking up girls. And that was kind of, my, I say my MO for a large portion of my life up until, till then. And that, that slow creep started to happen because I started to be in a long-term relationship. And so part of my body was like, well, wait a minute, you're trying to slow down and try to do things more proper or more right than you, you had been doing. Uh, so that was one thing relationship wise. And then the substances for me and the main substance uh, abusing was, was alcohol and uh i i wouldn't attend an event unless i was able to to drink at it i I'd go to happy hours i would pre-game i would go out then i would post game and and that was just what i thought that life was up, up until that point and I, I i just started to really lose control of, of things uh and as all that was going on i had still attained my degrees uh, I still was uh, starting to teach. Uh, so there were a lot of positives that were still happening. I wrote my first book. Uh, and then I, I just, I got, you know, leading up to November, 2017, it, everything just started 
to overcome my mind because I was basically withdrawing from a substance that I had been using and abusing for many years. I was going from dating many people at the same time to dating one person and then getting married. And so my my body was just having a, a, a tough time adjusting. And I was really at a, just a, I think just a breaking point. My body hadn't dealt with issues and things because I would just drink them away. Uh, and so that that's what led to being admitted. But even before being admitted, I had uh, three ER visits in two weeks. I had numerous visits to the general physician uh, because I would I would be having these panic attacks. You know, I'd be at work. I'd be having a panic attack. I'd have to leave a meeting. I'd be teaching and I'd have a panic attack when there's a presentation going on. And so th- all these things just slowly crept into uh, that that low point. And luckily, the psych staff came in uh, to to the ER that that last that last visit I had and gave me a choice and said, "Well, you're not dying right now. I know you feel like you are. We've run all these tests, so we can release you, or you can admit voluntarily admit yourself." Uh, they weren't going to pink slip me against my will, uh, but it was it was up to me. And so at that point, I was married for a few short months. And so I would look at my wife. I was like, well, what do I do? And she said, well, whatever you, whatever you think you need to do, uh, it, it, if this is something you feel you need to do, then you know, I'll support you. Uh, and while it was my lowest point, those five days, it was a start of something good and, and yeah, just good for, good for my life to help lead to where I'm at now. Magnesium is integral for 600 plus biochemical processes in the human body. And yet most people are deficient. Common signs of magnesium deficiency include fatigue, muscle weakness, stunted growth, poor immune function, poor concentration and memory, hormonal imbalances, bone and teeth problems. Most people think grabbing a bottle of whatever cheap stuff on the shelf or at the top of Amazon will solve this. The common misconception is that consuming more magnesium will automatically improve health and well-being. The truth is there are various forms of magnesium, each of which is essential for a variety of physiological processes. Most people are deficient in all forms of magnesium, while even those considered healthy typically only ingest one or two kinds. Consuming all seven of magnesium's primary forms is the key to accessing all of its health benefits. That's why we pack seven forms of 450 milligrams of elemental magnesium into each serving of Wild Mag Complex. One dose a day is all you need. Learn more and grab a bottle today at wildfoods.co. Use code GENIUS for 10% off your order. What did it, um, I mean, in retrospect, what did it teach you? Like, you know, if you can, talk about the experience mm-hmm. right when it happened. And then if you can, talk about your reflection on it later on now that it's long over. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. At the time, I, I was just feeling a lot of, a lot of emptiness, a lot of uh, not being fulfilled, even though I did complete and accomplish a lot of neat things, presented to boards of directors and presidents and CEOs and C suites, and uh, being able to do those types of things right out of right out of school uh, was something that I. I, I cherished and I, I wanted to do. And when I started to really slow down my life for whatever reason that was, it was a higher power uh, or if it was me, I believe it's a combination. Uh, but when that all started to, to happen, I, I felt like I didn't have any control. I, I would try Googling answers to my questions uh, just over and over and over and over again. Uh, at one point I felt I had, AIDS. <laughs> I mean, and I, and, and so I went and got drug tested and my, my now wife is like, wait a minute. And so there's all these things because up until that point, I really was a little bit reckless with, with my life. Uh, I mean, nothing say illegal type, type of deal, but, uh, you know, things that were a little bit risky. Uh, and, and so I just really across the board, it really, uh, the experience just took me in a, really a dark place uh and i should have took the signs that i i needed help uh, sooner uh 
part of it is the stigma of being a guy. Part of it's the just mental health. Uh, and then part of it was, oh my gosh, I might need to take medication the rest of my life. How am I going to be able to party and drink and do those types of things? Um, you know, the, whatever type of mental health med- medication, uh, depression, anxiety, wh- whatever that would be. Uh, and all those things kind of come into a head. It really brought me to just a, a bottom. And the bottom, I was really, when I was admitted, I didn't have a phone. Uh, basically on suicide watch, you know, every 15 minutes, even when you're sleeping, someone would come by the room and check on everybody. Uh, you weren't able to have shoelaces, belts, just anything that could, could harm you. And at that point, I felt that my life was just spiraling out of control and I wasn't able to take a deep breath, which a lot of people are like, just take a deep breath, just go for a walk. Um, and I was thinking inside that, that I think I need something more than, more than that. Um, now reflecting back. I'm glad I got the help when I did because I felt I needed the help. And I also felt and feel now that that was probably my last opportunity to to get the help. Uh, in a way, with all the visits to the general physician and the ER, I was crying out for help kind of in a, in a symbolic type of way of I want to be seen. There's something wrong. Admit me. Help fix me. Help get me on the right right page and right path, and uh, and so I'm like I said that was the lowest point that at stay in the hospital and it was scary. Like okay, am I gonna is somebody gonna want to fight me? Like well, what's it gonna be like? Are people gonna be screaming and all? How how am I gonna get through this? Uh, and so I looking back, I really do. I'm thankful for that opportunity that I was able to to get the help. Uh, but it was also very, it was very costly, even within insurance. And so that really brought me to another area of, oh my gosh, I'm getting the help and I'm getting everything I need, but how much is this going to cost me? Like, I don't have a ton of money. My family's that rich. Uh, and, and so all those types of things, I just had to put on the back burner and say, I need the help and let it be. What did the, the help turn out to be? Yeah. So the helps went from me to we so instead of me trying to handle everything to tackle every problem every situation uh the the help turned into having the we so it's the the team of having a psychiatrist that is able to uh, go with the diagnosis and and ask me what i'm working on how i feel in different situations what's coming up uh and then if they need to tweak you know the, the medication uh that i accepted okay if i need to take medication for a period of time or for the rest of my life, then I'll, I'll do it. Uh, uh, so the help of the psychiatrist, uh, while they also uh, do counsel as well, uh, I, I have a therapist I see regularly. Uh, and some people get scared of, I don't, I don't need to go to therapy. You know, they're going to ask me all these, these questions, these deep questions. Uh, and I would say, well, you know, at the beginning to kind of get that baseline, uh, but, you know, sitting, you know, close to six years removed, my, my visits now in a simple way is what's going on in life? What, what's stressing you out? Are you tanking on too many projects? Are you saying yes to the right things? No to the things that even though you want to do them, would that, would that overload you? Um, I'm eating. So that's a, <laughs> that's a good, good thing. Sometimes more than, than I should. Uh, I, I take a, it's either insure or boost or a protein bar uh, that has the, the vitamins in it. So I know that at the very least, I'm going to get that in, in my body. Um, and that's something from the hospital uh, when I was in, in the inpatient that that was one thing that I brought with me all these years of that was something that they put on my tray for every meal. And so that's something that I, I, I just continue, just make sure that if I fall off the boat for a day or two or however that might be that I will. Uh, I, I will get, get some nu- nutrients and, and nutrition in, into my body. Why was it hard for you to eat? Is it still hard for you to eat? Not now. Now it's not hard for me to eat. The eating, uh, issues that I had went through in 2017 and leading up to that, uh, really, I, I think had a lot to do with just the stress and I would be multitasking on so many different things that I would almost forget to eat, which is weird. So I would wake up in the morning and 
I would start working on something and then it would be eight, nine, ten o'clock. Uh, and then I'd be like, well, it's, you know, too, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it's too late for breakfast and it's too early for lunch. So then I want to eat so that I would keep working on something, uh, another project. And I would just have all these ideas and these things I needed to do. Then the guilt and the shame and all these things just took over my, my mind. I mean, I didn't feel like I was a robot in any, any sense, but I was definitely very, very stressed, uh, and, had a high level of, of anxiety and that would take me to miss meals. Then when I would go to eat, I would have in my mind that, oh, well, there's people that are allergic to certain, you know, to gluten and, and, and different types of foods. And so I would have these feelings where my body would tell me what I was thinking, like, oh, well, I'm, I'm allergic, so I can't get white bread. So I need to get wheat bread. Well, this one might have too much of a certain type of whether it's a seed or grain. And, and so it would just be like this endless, endless cycle that, that would happen. And, and then it got to the point where I, I, I was just, a t- I, my body was tired mentally, physically. Uh, and I, I just wasn't, wasn't putting the calories in because I was like, well, I'm allergic to this now and I'm allergic to that. And the doctors would say, have you ever been allergic to things? And I'm like, no. And my wife would say, no, he hasn't. He's it's like a self-talk led to self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And like talking about it now, it seems just crazy as I'm talking about it. Of like, I can't believe that that's where I was at. Uh, but at the but time- it sounds like you weren't sleeping well, you weren't eating well, you weren't doing well socially, you were you know, drinking, who knows how much. Yep. So I guess all those things contributed to your body saying, hey, Something's wrong. You're not taking care of me. So therefore, the only way, the only language I could speak to you in is panic attacks, anxiety, depression, et cetera. You got it. I don't know. You got it. Yeah, totally. And so, the, as far as the you know the the, the help uh, and, and what that all all, all looks like uh, with the organization Voices for Voices, I'm able to put my mind to really talk about my mental health to bring people and share their mental health, their stories, their triumphs uh, from, you know, we, we've had people on our podcast, like you have stars. We've had uh, people that have been incarcerated. We've had people uh, that are just living life and having a hard time in college and going from high school to, to college and talking about their experiences, uh, law enforcement and, just really bringing people together and just say, you know, everybody has a, a has a voice, and that really has helped with, say, my my care of it's it's really by being able to to do that type of work and accept it myself, and then be able to help others accept it or continue on their journey uh, has been very helpful to be doing something besides the teaching uh, to that I. I I'm really bought in from an emotional side, not just, you know, the paycheck side, which is where I was at another, another area that I was at. I was, you know, I was going for titles and you know, like, oh, I'm going to move to Houston for a period of time from Ohio for a couple of years, chasing titles and international business and come to find out that wasn't healthy because I was chasing something that I, I, I didn't care what the, in, in a sense what the corporate uh, mission and vision was. I wasn't bought in because I just wasn't emotionally tied in. I was just tied into the, I say the tangible things that I could be an analyst, a senior analyst and a manager and, and going up the chain instead of being like, you know what, like on my worst day, I still feel like coming to work and, and being able to put my best foot forward. Uh, and so that has been a, a big help. Um, and then I also wrote as my second book, Prescription for Living, also under the House of You moniker, uh, my brand, and that was really helpful to share my story. Has been helpful not only to me and kind of that journaling type type of way of getting things off my mind, off my chest, uh, but being able to talk about that in the classroom too. Uh, I've had very good feedback from students that say thank you for you know, being an instructor and, and professor and, and talking about these types of things. That's cool. uh, being a human being. Um, so it's it's very fulfilling at this point. Yeah, I would think a lot of people would see their professor as, as kids would see an adult. You know, oh, wow, this guy is a professor. He's not supposed to have any problems. He knows everything because he's the teacher. And 
and all that. So you became more human to them, I guess, by telling them about your experience. You got it. That's consider better myself. Yeah. Well, that's really good. So looking back for other people listening to this podcast and your podcasts and all that that are, you know, on the downward slope or they're just down in the depths, what are some of the first things that they can do to help themselves that you've seen that you think would work best for them? I know everyone's different. I know you're not a doctor, et cetera, with all those caveats, but just based on your experience, um, what would you say to people so they can start to get the help they need? Yeah, I would say, first off, and, and it's not cliche, it's okay. You're, everybody is going through something and has gone through something. Maybe it's not as extreme, but that, to accept it and say, you know what, that that's me. I'm a human being. And then that's something that my body is going through. And it's not a point. It's not all the time. It's a point in time this is happening. And maybe it's been a couple of years or a couple of weeks or days. Uh, so it's okay uh, is the first thing just to mentally clear that hurdle. And then secondly is there's just a ton of, ton of resources out there. Uh, but my organization from a placement uh, in Northeast Ohio, uh, we're, we're, we're growing, uh, we're national and international in other areas. Uh, but from a placement of somebody calls in, somebody messages and says, hey, Justin, hey, Voices for Voices, I need some help. I need to be seen today. I can't wait the three months that it's going to take for me to get into to, to be seen, which is how just the referral process works sometimes, which is why I circumvented all that and went to the emergency room, which if you have to do that, then do that. Uh, but with my organization, we we link up with, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, not just hospitals, but providers that are able to see somebody, whether it's virtual or in person, uh, within the week. And so that's that's huge. Uh, and to remember, it's just a conversation. If I'm going through these things, is there something that can help me uh, get to a point where they don't bother me quite as much? And I mean, I still have low days and there's things that still bother me, but the intensity is not there. And then I would say the third thing would be as hard as it is, it, given our hyperactive society with social media, smartphones, don't worry about what other people think or say. And I know that's hard because even in my instance, there were times at my lowest point leading into that visit, a uh, five-day visit to the ER that I had, where th there were members of my family who were ultra supportive. They weren't going through what I was going through. And so they would sometimes say things like, just get through it, stop crying, just go for a walk. And sometimes you just have to do things your own way and you have to just power through it. And so reach out and schedule that appointment and talk to somebody. Uh, and if somebody says, oh, well, you know, you're crazy, I had to just really get past that. I had to get past myself first and then how I was going to be perceived, how was my employer how are my students going to see me? How are they going to, they're going to look down on me. And through where I'm at today, uh, if I wouldn't have made that third hurdle, uh, I wouldn't have got the help. I wouldn't have continued to stay on the path because many people are like, when, when, when are you going to stop therapy? When are you going to cite your medication? And I'm like, well, it's working for me. So I'm not going to do, I'm not going to stop. Why, why would I? Um, and so preventative maintenance for the individual or individuals out there, uh, you know, to talk to somebody, to help talk through some difficult situations that that's what, you know, the counselor is there for. You don't, you don't have to, and everybody doesn't have to take medication. That might be a route or maybe someone wants to go more holistic route, but talking to somebody and getting your options is, is huge. Uh, so get over it yourself, reach out for the, the resources, organizations like myself, or if you know, they're in Chicago or LA, uh, depending on where, where they're at, there's organizations that can help place individuals with organizations, kind of that matchmaker of, okay, we have openings here. And so you can be seen at this day and this time, does this work for you? And then right. when you're getting that help, don't don't worry what other people think and, and say that I, I look at, if I wanted that to help I needed, I wouldn't be able to help the people I can today. So if I had worried about all the people and all the noise out there, uh, then I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And there's that old saying, you can't pour from your cup if your cup isn't even full yourself. 
the physical aspects. So again, sleeping better, eating better, having relationships, you know, not having alcohol or other drugs. Can that come last or can it come first for someone that's suffering from anxiety, depression, OCD, et cetera? Does it have to come last? Like, What, what do you see as the order of, of operations that would help someone? The, yeah, the order of operations. So it can come first or it can come last. For instance, when I had I had my five day stay. Uh, I had multiple group therapies after that. And there were people that were going through some of the same things I was, and they were still drinking throughout the week. And so they were just at a different point in, in the recovery and how they wanted to recover. And so I would say that it, it ends up being an individual thing. So some individuals at first, like for me, it was like at that, that five day stay, I, I just said, well, in order for me to basically survive to get real down to the, the core of being a human being, I'm going to have to listen to the doctors. I'm going to have to have people on my team and believe that they want the best for me, That which for me, trust had been huge up to that point of, I can't trust them. They're just saying that to make money and whatever, all these convoluted thoughts that I would have. So it wouldn't, wouldn't matter where in that thought process or in that path where somebody decides, okay, like I'm going to just stop. And so that might work for some, it might not for, for others. Um, if I really wanted to, I could have, I could drink a little bit, but I know that if I start, it's going to be hard to stop. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, that's a long answer to your, your question. Are people capable of doing those things or do they really need therapy first? Or do they really need to take the edge off first in order to do those things? No, it seems like those things can't come first, even though they're maybe the root of the problem or part of the root that puts someone down this path. Like for you, to, it sounds like you had to do therapy and medication first, and then you could fix all the other stuff. So I just wonder, in your experience, which way is more common that again those those fundamentals have to wait until you're kind of off the ledge, or can they happen first? Or is it too hard? No, I don't. I don't think it's too hard. I think for me, it. it it wouldn't have worked, uh, but no, it's, it's, it's not too hard to put those first and not do the medication for, you know, whenever the process starts, maybe it's six months and they work on things that, uh, on their, their own or through a support group. Uh, and maybe, maybe it's six months. And so maybe the individual's like, okay, well, I tried this and this isn't working. So maybe let me, let me look into exploring what else I can do so they can start working on that themselves and say, Oh, well, if they know, and they say, okay, well, I can pinpoint exactly the root of everything. And they you know, work on thing one, thing two, and thing three, they might not need any therapy. They might need any medication. It depends on the makeup of the individual and, and what, what they can get through. I think I was just, I'm just a weak, <laughs> I'm just a weak person. So I, I needed the, this process for me. Uh, I don't think you're a week. I just think it's people need help, you know, and maybe they, I mean, you know, if I'm having a, a really tough day, it's hard for me to get anything done. I mean, my wife's mad at me or something, you know, or um, sometimes you just need things, I guess, to again take the edge off and just make it a little bit easier. So you're like, okay, now I can do this, now I can do that. Before I was just too amped up or too frenzied. I just didn't think I couldn't calm myself to do anything. So I'm just wondering, like I said, yeah, it's not that you're, you're a failure. I think everyone's experienced that. So I don't know, maybe a better question is like, what, what do you see that can help people take the edge off so they can help themselves more than they were able to? Big is uh, the, the phone, uh, just taking time away from the phone, even if it's just for 10 minutes. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, there's studies about everything, but there was a study that I saw taking a 10 minute break in between even Zoom calls uh, if somebody's working 100 percent remote and they have zoom calls and they're just constantly online and have to be quote unquote on for a lot of the day uh and, and be present and asking and answering and contributing um that adds its whole so taking even just 10 minutes uh, away uh from the devices uh, away from the computer whether that's going for a walk you don't have, they don't have to go for a walk just step away from the devices so that was something that I did, I'd say right away. Uh, I went from my iPhone to a flip phone right after the hospital. Uh, and that was, that was incredible. I mean, you would talk about having, 
having time to think and being able to work through things in your mind, that was incredible. And then time got to be where I asked my wife, do I, should I go back to the iPhone? And she's like, were you ready for it? And again, that, that's my, that was my situation. Uh, but that just leads to, you know, time away from, from the phone, the mind is able to, I don't know, somebody looks outside their house and says, oh, wow, there's a cardinal sitting on a tree branch. Like those two seconds or five seconds or two to five seconds or whatever that amount of time is that they're not thinking about something that is going to probably potentially stress them out. Um, so being able to get you know, away from the vices, whether it's into nature for a walk or even just that headspace to, to, to view, look outside or sit outside on, on the deck. And I know on winter time and kind of, kind of hard to do, but you know, fine. Find something. I would. I would say something else that worked for me at, at different times, different points. Or you know, those adult coloring books. Those are things that it's still constructive to do, and it could take I don't know a week or two to to color. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You can pick what colors you want to do, and you could fill up half of it, the, all of the polar bear or whatever that that actual picture is. But that has really helped de-stress me in different times. And just really help me concentrate, but focus on something that you know, doesn't have the you know the, the blue light that's gonna that's programmed to take our take our attention. Um, and then I would say, lastly, on, on this, uh, there are um, different blue light blocking glasses that are, are out there. You know, ten dollars, they're very inexpensive. Um, that I've worn uh, in, during different interviews, or if I'm around a lot of lights, usually if I'm in the studio tape into uh, the podcast and the TV studio, uh, the, the lights still bother me, but I'll sometimes wear these blue light blocking glasses. They just look like regular glasses. Um, and that helps with the glare and the intensity of feeling like, like I'm warming up and then that could lead to a panic attack. Uh, and so that, that also is, is helpful when slowing the, the, the brain down. Um, if, if somebody has to be on the, on the computer or on a screen for a lot of time during throughout the day. Like are you seeing that um so COVID and everything that people are more anxious and depressed? And if so, like um I don't know, what are some new techniques that you're, you know, telling to your students or suggesting to them so they could help themselves? Oh yeah, for yeah, after your first question, absolutely. Uh students are more yeah, more stressed, more worried. Uh, students are able to go to the accessibility department and say, you know, I, I'm extra anxious, uh, have this extra anxiety. And then they're able to get, whether it's more time on an exam or uh, an extra, an extension on an assignment, uh, more of that is happening. It's a one of one of two things. Either they're cut, that students are coming forward and just acknowledging it because mental health is hopefully getting to be more mainstream of everybody has it regardless of whether they have a mental illness or, or not, uh, or uh, the the fact that it's just affecting their life just in a in a, in a way that maybe maybe those tasks of going to eat with friends or driving in a car or, or being in a crowd of people maybe those things really are uh, really are affecting themselves. So yeah, it's it's definitely from from that aspect stepping out of the the, the COVID, hopefully the pandemic, epidemic, all, all that. Um, and then secondly, from a, what I what I recommend and what, what I suggest is uh, I suggest journaling. And so somebody doesn't have to be a writer, but if they if something's in their mind and it's their mind just keeps coming back to this thing or this experience, whatever that may be, just write it down. Uh, I found that that is helpful to me because once it's written down, I don't have to show it to anybody. I don't have to show it my counselor. I can just throw it away. I can shred it. Uh, but by taking information, experiences out of my head and putting them on paper, it frees up my mind for that one thing that might have, you know, I might have been thinking about it for a week. And it might be as simple as writing two sentences or three sentences of summarizing what, what the thought process is. And then no longer is that, uh, that coming into the mind. There's other things that come into to the mind. Uh, mm. So journaling and then being the gratitude journal. Uh, that's something that I used to go, oh, well, yeah, I can't think of three things that I'm grateful for each day. 
but once I went through what I went through, and, I, and I'm still going through it, it, it every day is a, a new day. Uh, but by writing, even you know, I'm bang, I'm grateful that I woke up today and that I'm alive. And as basic and as menial as it might sound, that there are people that whether they have a disease or not, they they might just have a heart attack while they're sleeping and not wake up. And so right. that's something that could be helpful. And so again, that kind of goes into getting information out of the mind, putting it on paper, um, and then being being gracious or the you know, the gratitude for something as small as you know I'm able to eat today I'm not I, I didn't have a panic attack those types of things but doing that on a continued basis those are those are helpful and, and things I share all the time to my my students of what are actionable things that you can do right now not something that you can do in a year not something that costs you know a thousand dollars or a lot of money I want things that I I or somebody else can can do even if it's while I'm talking to them. And those are things that I've gotten feedback in, in a positive sense of I was able to do that. And I didn't realize how basic it is, uh, but how it free up my mind for that one thing. And then they're able to pack in another idea into that mind. Hmm. Okay. So where can people uh, find out more about your work? You mentioned uh, Voices for Voices. Um, so where can people find out about that, your podcast? You can give listeners a place to go so they can learn more with you. Yeah, so voicesforvoices.org. So we're a full 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, so voicesforvoices.org, that gives uh, what our, our mission, our vision, what donations go to uh, events that we've had in, in the past. It talks about, they say, the three pillars of educating, placing, financially sponsoring, and then that career uh, reintegration into to society and into the workforce or starting their own business. Uh, the, the three pillars of uh, what Voices for Voices stands for. Uh, and then the podcast, it's uh, it's, it's weekly. It airs locally here in Northeast Ohio on our PBS station, uh, but it is also on our uh, Voices for Voices uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and so that, that comes out every Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Sometimes we'll have a bonus episode depending on the subject matter. And obviously we know the different holidays and in days of remembrance, uh, the, with April being uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, uh, we've had a couple bonus episodes because we wanted to get individuals that we might have taped back in uh, back in January. We would want to get them and edit, being able to uh, put their episode out while it makes sense for just individuals that might be tuned in more than others. And then we're we're just really just going day by day and helping where we can. We're helping locally, nationally, internationally. We're going to be going overseas uh, to, again, uh, coming up to uh, help some of the displaced Ukraine refugees. And so we really want to, we just want to empower people and say, wow, like I can do this. And it's fun. It really is fulfilling. And I'm just glad to be able to do that. And then the books. So the House of You brand has the workforce book. And my mental health uh, journey; uh, those are both on on Amazon. They're on Audible, iTunes. Individuals can find where those are at specifically on VoicesForVoices.org, or they can go to thehouseofyou.com, and that has links and or people can buy directly. Uh, they can point themselves uh, or others to that uh, content. And then we're also on Instagram and Facebook at Voices. Four voices, and the four is spelled out F O R, um, and we're very active on, on those platforms. Okay, very good. Thing. Well, Justin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and being so open about your experiences, and and hopefully it'll help a lot of listeners. I, I appreciate you being here. The absolute. Thank you for having me. Magnesium is integral for six hundred plus biochemical processes in the human body, and yet most people are deficient. Common signs of magnesium deficiency include fatigue muscle weakness, stunted growth, poor immune function, poor concentration and memory, hormonal imbalances, bone and teeth problems. Most people think grabbing a bottle of whatever cheap stuff on the shelf or at the top of Amazon will solve this. The common misconception is that consuming more magnesium will automatically improve health and well-being. The truth is there are various forms of magnesium, each of which is essential for a variety of physiological processes. Most people are deficient 
in all forms of magnesium, while even those considered healthy typically only ingest one or two kinds. Consuming all seven of magnesium's primary forms is the key to accessing all of its health benefits. That's why we pack seven forms of 450 milligrams of elemental magnesium into each serving of Wild Mag Complex. One dose a day is all you need. Learn more and grab a bottle today at wildfoods.co. Use code GENIUS for 10% off your order. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.